Hi, Josh. Hi, Amanda. What are we talking about today? We're going to talk about non-competes, something that we cover quite a bit on these videos, but it comes up a lot. We see potential clients from Connecticut or even other states that come to us and they're questioning whether or not a non-compete they have is enforceable. So what do they do? They Google it like everything else, and they find a term called blue penciling. And they come to us and they say, well, Connecticut blue pencils, and that's good for me, right? But they usually don't understand what the term means. So I thought you could explain for our viewers, what is blue penciling and how does it impact a Connecticut employee that has a non-compete? In general, blue penciling is good for employers trying to enforce non-competes, not for employees trying to get out of them. So that's the first thing. But let's back up. The term blue penciling actually comes out of the 19th century practice of editing documents, not just legal documents, but any kind of writing, using a pencil with lead that was dyed blue so that the printers could tell what was original and what was a later edition. And the legal concept grows out of that 19th century editing practice. The term refers to overbroad provisions and contracts being rewritten so they can be narrow enough to be enforceable. We often see it in the context of non-competes and other restrictive covenants, like non-solicits or non-service agreements. Um, and whether blue penciling is allowed is going to be a question of state law. So I'm gonna tell you the answer in Connecticut, but other states might have other answers, all right? So in Connecticut, you can have blue penciling, that is a court or an arbitrator is allowed to rewrite an overbroad clause that would not otherwise be enforceable if the contract says you can. So often a non-compete will have a provision that says something like, uh, the parties want this clause to be enforceable. If a judge or arbitrator determines that the clause is too broad to be enforceable, the parties are asking the judge or arbitrator to rewrite the clause to make it as enforceable as it can be under the law. Even if you have a clause like that, a blue penciling clause that expressly permits the uh, judge or arbitrator to blue pencil the clause, there's still going to be a, dis a dispute between lawyers in Connecticut who do this work about the scope of blue penciling. On the narrow side are those who believe that blue penciling is allowed only when the court is crossing out provisions. And on the broader side, there are those who think that blue penciling allows for a complete rewrite of a clause. Okay, let me give you an example. Imagine a clause that says, you cannot compete with us in Hartford, West Hartford, Avon, Simsbury, Farmington, East Hartford, Wethersfield, right? The court might see that clause and say, you know what, I think those outer towns, that's too far. I'm going to cross out Simsbury. I'm going to cross out Wethersfield. I'm going to leave the rest. That would be the narrow version because the court is just crossing out. But imagine if instead the clause said, you cannot compete with, with us within 25 miles of Hartford. Well, the court might say, I think 25 miles is too far. I would have been willing to enforce five miles, but you didn't give me that option, right? I would have to rewrite the clause to do it. And I'm not going to do that. I don't think blue penciling allows me to rewrite. I could have crossed out, but I'm not going to rewrite. So that's the dispute. And sometimes you will see non-competes that are written in, in a strange way because of this understanding of blue penciling. They might say something like, you can't compete within 25 miles, and if not 25, 20, and if not 20, 15, and if not 15, 10, and if not 10, 5. And the reason they do that, it might seem very odd, is because the lawyer drafting the provision wants to ensure as much as possible that the court will do the blue penciling of striking out the provision. That is, will find that the different pieces of the geographic restriction are what's called severable. They make sense separate from one another. Now, I should say here that judges and arbitrators have a lot of discretion about whether to engage in blue penciling. And some of them just think blue penciling is a really bad idea. They're skeptical of the practice. And you can sort of understand why, because it creates really perverse incentives for employers. If an employer can have a non-compete that says, you can't compete with me anywhere in the world, and the court's going to come back and say, no, no, it's just 25 miles, well, then the employer is getting a lot of essentially prevention with an overbroad non-compete that couldn't be enforced. And it's scaring away employees who don't either have the the um, instinct, the nerve, or the resources to challenge that non-compete. So the in the alternative of blue penciling, then the non-compete or that section of, say, an employment agreement that includes a non-compete compete would simply be unenforceable, right? Well, that's a little complicated, but basically, yes. If the non-compete has a geographic provision, for example, a mileage restriction that is unenforceable and cannot be rewritten, then the whole non-compete will fall. 
right? The whole non-compete will be crossed out because it's in, that geographic restriction is inseparable from the broader non-compete. That doesn't mean that the whole agreement in which the non-compete exists, an, an employment contract, for example, will be unenforceable. As long as the non-compete is separable from the rest of the contract, then you would just cross out the non-compete, you would ignore it, and the rest of the contract would hold. And that's the doctrine of what we call severability which is the issue of whether something, whether basically a broader document makes sense without the piece that is unenforceable. Really useful information. Thank you, Josh. And thank you for watching. If you have questions, give us a call. Take care.